We are back, and you're listening to the Critical Hour on Radio Sputnik. I'm Wilmer Leon, joined here by my co-host, Garland Nixon. Thank you, Wilmer. There's a very good piece by Peter Beinhardt in the Beinhardt Notebook entitled American Exceptionalism as Magical Thinking. Beinhardt writes, quote, A remarkable exchange took place last Wednesday at the State Department. Asked about the International Criminal Court's decision to launch an investigation into Israeli and Palestinian crimes in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, State Department spokesman Ned Price began dutifully reciting his lines. Quote, we firmly oppose and are disappointed by the ICC prosecutor's announcement of an investigation into the Palestinian situation. We will continue to uphold our strong commitment to Israel and its security and including by opposing actions that seek to target Israel unfairly, end quote. If this isn't warped thinking of American exceptionalism, I don't know what is. For insight into this, we turn to our next guest. He's a frequent collaborator with all major news outlets and author of City Builders and Vandals in Our Age, Caleb Moppin. As always, Caleb, welcome back. Sure. Glad to be here, as always. Provide us with some insight into this idea of American exceptionalism and its origins. Well, it's quite interesting. The term American exceptionalism actually goes back to 1928, when there was a disagreement inside of the Communist Party of the United States. Uh, In 1928, the Communist International had their sixth World Congress, and at that Congress, they changed a lot of their orientation. Um, they started, you know, being more rival and more of a rivalry with the socialist parties of the world. Um, they started trying to form independent communist unions. And there was a leader of the American Communist Party named Jay Lovestone. And Jay Lovestone disagreed. And he argued that these tactical shifts that the Communist Party was directed to adopt in 1928, that these tactical shifts uh, did, should not apply to the United States. Uh, they may be correct for the rest of the world. But the United States was the exception. And Joseph Stalin and William Z. Foster accused J. Lovestone of American exceptionalism. And that is actually where the phrase comes from. It's very fascinating. Um, And they did not mean it as a good thing. They meant it as a negative thing. He was arguing that Marxism and the Marxist theories and the tactical orientation of the Communist International did not apply to the United States. The United States was exceptional. And uh, based on that, they were kicked out of the Communist Party. Now, interestingly, Jay Lovestone ended up becoming one of the top trade union organizers for the U.S. Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, He set up the, uh, I think it's called the International Committee of Free Trade Unions, uh, which worked with the CIA around the world to run trade unions that were anti-communist and would help with U.S. foreign policy goals. Um, So it's kind of interesting. Uh, When Obama took office, he was widely accused of being the first president in U.S. history who did not believe in American exceptionalism. And there started to be broad discussion of the term and the fact that it originated in this 1928 debate within the Communist Party uh, came up and was was acknowledged. It's it's rather a a fascinating history. But yes, this is one of those terms that uh, has entered American discourse as part of the obscure arguments uh, between communists uh, back in the 1920s. but really, when, when most people refer to American exceptionalism, what they're referring to is, as the author of the article put it, magical thinking. Uh, this belief that somehow the United States is so special that the United States has manifest destiny and that the laws and standards by which you apply countries do not apply to the United States, that the USA has a special destiny. Um, and it's interesting because in a, in a lot of cases, some people will even fit that in with theology. Um, you know, a lot of the religious right will argue that the United States has a has, has been specially ordained by God to spread freedom around the world, uh, which I, I don't really think you can find in the Bible. Uh, there's no there's no biblical uh, justification for that. Um, and uh, it, it is it is a very unique thing. But this American exceptionalism, the belief that you know America is the greatest country in the world that America has this unique destiny, that America is always on the side of right around the world. If, if people are too critical, you need to stop them and silence them because they're anti-American or they hate America. Well, this is what American exceptionalism generally refers to. It's kind of the mythology that holds U.S. society together, with which if we look at the results of the recent elections, if we listen to political discourse in the United States, it seems that in addition to our economic problems, in addition to our political problems, 
we seem to be facing kind of a spiritual problem in this country because the mythology, uh, this belief that the United States was exceptional and special and had this magical, magical freedom power or something, this myth that held U.S. society together, does not seem to be believed by the people on the right or by people on the left. Um, Donald Trump said, make America great again, like he was going to restore the exceptional quality of the United States that many people on the right wing feel has been lost. Uh, the, the left wing, with their belief in identity politics and their you know, talk about the United States being a country founded on genocide and slavery, they no longer believe in the American exceptionalism narrative. So American exceptionalism has gone away. Um, meanwhile, U.S. foreign policy is still justified in terms of American exceptionalism. This is a very interesting aspect of the crisis we are living in in our time. Beinhardt writes, the essence of American exceptionalism is that the United States possesses a virtue so intrinsic that it cannot be falsified by events. It's an assertion, not a fact, but of faith. If American exceptionalism rested on empirical evidence, spokespeople like Price would modulate their assertions based on America's actions. Go ahead, Garland. Well, and that fits in perfect but what with what I was going to say because in this article the state department spokesman is asked a very reasonable question and he responds with absurdities and gibberish. And I think what we see here is that if American exceptionalism is scrutinized through a lens of of logic and through a lens of reason it's exposed as a self-serving mythology. You know, the guy asked a reasonable, logical question that called for a reasonable, logical answer, and what he got was absurdities, and it just exposes. Uh, within the dynamic of American exceptionalism, you can't have a logical, reasonable answer because it doesn't make sense unless you see it as some kind of a religion where there is a hierarchy in the world, and the U.S. is not even a part of the hierarchy. The U.S. is like a God-like figure above the hierarchy that maintains and controls the hierarchy that only applies to other um, to, to other nations. Caleb, your thoughts? Oh, I, absolutely. That is absolutely the case. I mean, if one listens to many of the political speeches that will end in the United States, it's very common for politicians to end their speech with God bless America. Um, people have wondered, you know, I mean, is that a, a religiously correct statement? I mean, do we want the United States to get special treatment from the Almighty? Um, should we not be calling for God to grant his grace to maybe countries that are less fortunate than the United States? Um, and that, that American exceptionalism, it's never very clearly defined, right? There's no clear uh, definition of what it is. It's just kind of the United States is a great country. Uh, the United States has freedom. Uh, the United States goes around the world fighting dictators. Um, one thing that you notice that's part of American exceptionalism is the Second World War. Um, and that very much so, we, we've noticed, especially neoconservatives, would compare whoever the United States was fighting against to Hitler. Uh, I believe George Herbert Walker Bush referred to Saddam Hussein as, quote, a Hitler, right? Endless World War II analogies, right? And that there have been many World War II movies uh, that we've seen over the years. Um, and the idea that Whatever regime we are fighting against is, the, is somehow an exact replica of the Nazis, and that regime is on the verge of committing atrocities on the scale of the Holocaust. And we all know that the, you know, during the Second World War, uh, the United States rode in like a cowboy all by itself and defeated the Nazis and planted the American flag in Berlin, which is obviously not what happened. Um, you know, the mythology of the Second World War, the endless comparison uh, of military conflicts around the world to the Second World War, the belief that the United States is a Hollywood character, the United States is almost Superman flying in to rescue the innocent around the world, um, and, uh, and anyone who doesn't support our foreign policy doesn't understand the important role we have to rescue the innocent, because clearly... Clearly, uh, only enemies of the United States get engaged in atrocities, and all our allies are purely democratic, human rights-abiding uh, regimes. This, this narrative, it's never clearly defined. It's just a set of ideas. It's almost a set of emotions and feelings. Uh, you can imagine it might have been drawn up by perhaps a, an advertising institute. When people see flags, when people hear uh, certain patriotic songs, they start to have feelings. Uh, and these feelings are not exactly based on reality. But these are feelings that are supposed to prevent you from thinking and, and looking at empirical facts. And I think that's what uh, this, this response to this question really was. It was an appeal to such feelings and a desire to not actually engage with the facts. There's another piece that uh, we looked to today, America's 
forever wars have come back home. It's no coincidence that after years of fighting abroad, the United States is beset with paranoia, loss of trust, and increasingly bitter divisions. I think we found this in foreign policy. Your thoughts, because I found this article to be uh, incredibly insightful as well, as Garland and I saw this as being incredibly insightful. Your thoughts, Caleb? Well, this gets back to the fact that on the left and on the right, there doesn't seem to really be a belief in American exceptionalism anymore. And that this kind of Cold War belief that the United States was very, very special and and had the greatest system on the world, polls show that Americans of both the right and the left do not believe that. Um, And that Donald Trump, maybe his appeal is that he's going to bring it back. He's going to restore it. Um, But many people look at Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign, where her slogan was, America is great because America is good. And they say that Donald Trump had, you know, the upper hand because most Americans look at their country and look at the, you know, decline in wages and living standards and look at these forever wars that are wildly unpopular and say, no, we don't really feel like the country is so great right now. Um, And, you know, Hillary Clinton, you know, she was going around saying America is great because America is good, meaning that uh, because we have the best and the most moral values in the world, we are therefore the most powerful country in the world. That message did not resonate. If Hillary Clinton had run with that slogan in 1950 or 1960 or 1970, for that matter, it might have been a really good slogan. But uh, in 2016, that message fell flat. And you'll notice that Biden didn't even try to run with that message when he ran against Donald Trump. He ran much more on a platform of the country is falling apart. We've got an unstable guy at the top uh, who doesn't tell people to wear a mask and has mishandled COVID. I'll get things back to normal. Uh, but there wasn't a bombastic patriotic appeal because it appeared pretty clearly that, that Americans around the country, this mythology that held the country together is just no longer resonating among the U.S. public. Uh, you know, millennials and Zoomers, uh, they don't grow up believing that the United States is an infallible country with a special duty to spread freedom and democracy. They just don't believe that um, on the left or on the right. You know, on another on foreignpolicy.com, Stephen Walt writes, it's no coincidence that after years of fighting abroad, the United States is beset with paranoia, loss of trust and increasingly bitter divide, d- divisions. Americans forever wars have come home and he's got a picture of fences and barbed wire around the Capitol. Your thoughts, Caleb? Well, that's particularly interesting as well. Um, you know, Stephen Walt has been particularly critical of the Israel lobby and their influence in American politics. And, you know, you're forced to think of, uh, I believe it was Irving Kristol, one of the fathers of neoconservatism, who argued that society cannot be held together by a single truth. There are truths for the military. There are truths for the students and the youth. There are truths for the, the working class. There are truths for the intellectuals. And that, that societies are, 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 are functional because there are different beliefs by different strata. Um, and you're almost forced to think of the mystery cults of ancient Rome and how, you know, yes, in Rome, they did have basically the same religious beliefs. They worshipped, you know, Jupiter that was the king god, but the navy had their own kind of mystery cult where they worshipped the god of the ocean and had their own legends and beliefs. The the, the infantry had their beliefs, right? Uh, that, that some of the, the wealthy had their cults and their mystical cults. Uh, the, the proletarians had their beliefs. Um, And then in Roman society, it seemed like there were different beliefs for different strata. And on the surface of it, that might be good for holding a society together. But as we know, the Roman Empire spent 250 years in decline and ultimately fell. And the reason it fell was because increasingly there was not a unified vision. Um, People in the country had different interests. And if you get to the very, very end, uh, the twilight of the Roman Empire, Things were so bad that the Romans could not even, you know, assemble their own armies. At the time, they were fighting against people in Europe they referred to as barbarians, the Germanic tribes, the, the Vandals, the mm-hmm. Ostrogoths. Uh, these folks they were fighting against, they had to go find other, you know, quote-unquote barbarians and pay them to fight the ones they were fighting. They couldn't even assemble their own armies and, and march in and defeat the people trying to overthrow their empire. Caleb Moppin, as always, phenomenal analysis. Thank you so much for your time today. As always, man, we look forward to having you back. Sure thing. Always a pleasure. You're listening to The Critical Hour on Radio Sputnik. I'm Wilmer Leon, joined here by my co-host, Garland Nixon. There's more on the other side. Stay tuned. 